faves um, seminar of um, the visual seminar on uh, asset management. So today we are um, excited to have uh, David Schumark from um, McGill. And uh, he'll be uh, talking about uh, mutual fund proliferation as an entry deterrence strategy. And the previous title is the global menu of funds. In terms of formatting, like what we did in the past seminars, please just type your questions in the chat box. I'll bring those questions to David uh, periodically. If you really prefer, you can also unmute yourself and um, you know, ask a question directly. I will leave the room open after the 75 minutes, the usual time we have for this seminar. So David, you know, the floor is yours. You have 75 minutes, please uh, go ahead and start. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks everyone. And thanks for the uh, opportunity to present here. Uh, this is joint work with my uh, colleague Sebastian Betamier here uh, at, uh, at McGill and Ali Sharad is a uh, current slash just about to be former PhD student. And uh, let me just assure you, you are in the right talk. Um, this is the paper that was announced on Monday, the global menu of funds. And we're actively working on this paper. Um, and um, uh, today I'm presenting what is going to be a revised version. Uh, we put a lot of work into this and uh, the new title is going to be Mutual Fund uh, Proliferation as an Entry Deterrence Strategy and AKA the Global Menu of Funds. So um, let me jump right in here with um, by picking you up at a following uh, phenomenon that I believe many of you are probably familiar with, which is the uh, observation that the global mutual fund industry has witnessed uh, a tremendous amount of fund, of both fund and style proliferation. And, and what we mean by that is that the number of funds that are offered and sold to investors, uh, that number has grown tremendously, especially in the global uh, industry over the last 30 or so years. There is a, there's a, a longstanding comparison to compare the number of funds to the number of publicly listed uh, stocks um, going back to, I believe, Gruber or Götzmann. And uh, just to give you that benchmark number on a global scale, if you, over the last 30 years, the number of publicly listed firms has grown by about 3% on average on a, a year, whereas the number of active equity mutual funds has grown by about 9% uh, per year on average. So while 30 years ago, you had about uh, one fund for every four stocks, that's about even now. So we have about as many active equity funds as there are stocks worldwide. A second phenomenon that's gone hand in hand with that is that there's been also an almost equal proliferation in the number of investment styles that uh, firms like Morningstar classify funds into. So initially there were about 20 different styles originally and now Morningstar is keeping track of about hundred different investment styles. And if you go to even second layer classification that 100 can get even bigger um, as there are sort of subcategories that, you know, um, are even finer in classifying funds into ever more different investment styles. So there's been this tremendous amount of fund and style proliferation. And, and that is the first point we want to pick up here. And we want to put this first phenomena in context with a second phenomena. So at the same time, while the fund and the style offerings have proliferated tremendously, the industry at the firm level has become increasingly concentrated. And uh, the various ways of looking at it, what I'm showing you here is a, is, a, is a figure from another paper that I've been working on that is on consolidation between asset managers. And it's just an industry level observation that at the global level, um, the concentration of asset under management has almost doubled probably over the last 20 or so years. So it was about the top 1% of firms, this is the red line, a uh, number of firms, they were managing about 30% of the AUM, the turn of the century. And now at the end of our sample there, it's 55, maybe it's even higher now. So in our global sample that we're going to use here over a much longer um, time period, uh, spanning the global industry across many markets around the world, the growth rate in the number of firms has been substantially lower at around five and a bit percent, again, compared to the growth rate in the number of funds. 
which has been much higher um, there. So basically, we have at a, at a very aggregate uh, level uh, several observations that on the one hand, there are ever more funds and ever more styled styles launched by what appears to be an ever more concentrated uh, industry that is dominated by a small number of very large uh, mutual fund firms. So that is sort of the starting point uh, that motivates uh, the paper here. And we're basically um, picking up on the sort of classical question probably posed first by Gruber in the presidential address 96, why so many mutual funds? And, and we're saying, why, why so many mutual funds and styles in an industry that is becoming so concentrated? What is, how can we understand these industry dynamics? So to get to this question, um, we're going to, our paper is going to speak to the various forces that have been documented in the literature on what motivates fan families to launch uh, funds. And, and there's a long list of these, of these motives. Many have to do with standard competitive forces in the mutual fund industry, such as you know, meeting investor demand for particular investment objectives. Um, there is uh, an old observation on capital gains tax reduction that new funds are launched to reduce the capital gains tax overhang that existing funds may have. There are arguments about having different fee structures, different fee levels for different funds. There's a literature on tournament behavior that families would like to launch many funds. And I'm just giving one, one reference here, the Corona Surveys 99 paper that discusses many of these motives, um, and, but there are others, there's certainly more than there. I'm also highlighting here uh, a very relevant uh, recent paper uh, in the GF 2020 by Kostoveski and Warner that uh, talks about the motive of especially smaller and younger families to launch uh, differentiated funds vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the funds that are launched by incumbent families. And so, so product market differentiation is, is also one uh, very important motive that is established in the industry and that we're gonna come back to as we go through this talk. I'm highlighting here in the, in, to make a bit of a contrast for the sake of exposition. Um, there's also a literature that has in mind uh, different, and, and we label them here, more anti-competitive family level strategies. And, and that is a literature that that tries to think about the motives at the family level of what the, the total family offerings uh, could look like. There are two important papers here, the Nanda et al. 2000 and, and uh, Masat 2003 in the JF. So what is the idea in that, in that literature is that families have an overall family strategy to launch many, many mutual funds because the effort of the family is to ultimately segment the market for mutual funds to hold investors captive with the family. And uh, how does that argument work? So the idea is families launch many funds because they're different investors, heterogeneous investors. In the case of these papers, they're characterized as having different trading and liquidity needs. So investors wanna switch funds frequently. So the family wants to offer many switching options to investors while at the same time using barriers such as load fees and fee structures that encourage switching within the family, but not switching across families. And in this particular way, um, fund proliferation is part of a strategy to segment the market for mutual funds. So this is sort of um, the observation where we start and, and where we wanna come in with a new proposition, a new argument and a hypothesis that reconciles all these observations uh, but from a slightly different angle. So the argument or the hypothesis that we're proposing is that we want to argue that fund proliferation is a family strategy that is employed by families in an effort to what we call congest the product space and ultimately deter market entry, especially by small and new firms. So this is how we want to put into context the idea of fund proliferation as an entry deterrence strategy. I'm putting this word congest here in inverted commas because it, it's, it's a term that comes from the IO literature. I'm gonna explain uh, on two more slides exactly what that, what that means. But as a start, I just wanna make uh, clear how, how that motive is on the one hand, sort of related in spirit to this literature of Nanda and co-authors and Massa, but at the same time, it is a very different argument in the way that the motive works. 
because there are two things that are notably absent and that are critical to the, to the Massa especially uh, argument. The first one is that our hypothesis here does not rely on any fee structures, especially load fees. And the argument is that in the Massa paper, these are very important uh, barriers to support the family strategy. But empirically, uh, we've known for many years that load fees are disappearing and shared classes with load fees have been seen aggregate outflows for many years. If you go to the ICI effect book, you can see that documented. And if you, if you take a global perspective, load fees are actually banned in, in several countries now around the world. And there's a Morningstar report outlining that in great detail. But at the same time, while these structures have disappeared, um, there has been fund proliferation has been marching on uh, just as much. Another thing that our argument does not rely on is on any particular form of investor heterogeneity that would value switching or that value uh, the presence of these many, many different funds in its own right. Uh, and, and the results I'm gonna show you, in fact, would even look somewhat puzzling in light that investor heterogeneity is an important motivator um, of the behavior that we're gonna document. I want to be like we're not saying there is no heterogeneity. That's we're not saying that. We're just saying that our argument does not need any form of heterogeneity for that for, for it to be effective. So now that I've told you two things, what our argument does not depend on, let me let me tell you what it does depend on, and that will give us uh, hopefully a bit of an understanding of how we're going to structure this paper and how we're going to structure the presentation of the results uh, that are going to follow. So where does our motivation come from this hypothesis? To link fund proliferation to entry deterrence. The motivation for this goes back to uh, a somewhat uh, established literature in industrial organization that discusses different reasons why companies would want in general to engage in product proliferation, launching many, many different products. The particular thing that we're interested in is an expert testimony on a famous antitrust case in the US. That antitrust case has taken place in the ready-to-eat cereal market, so that's breakfast cereal. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a distance to mutual funds, but, but let me explain. So what happened in the 70s? There was an antitrust case against the three major cereal producers, Kellogg, uh, General Mills, and Quaker Oats, I think. And the antitrust case was saying that these three major producers were launching too many breakfast cereals, different varieties of breakfast cereals, in an effort to basically overcrowd the supermarket shelves. So it's gonna be very difficult for a new firm in that market to enter it because there's basically hardly any way to gain market share and, and therefore cover the entry costs into that market. So, and, and that is where the idea of congestion comes in is that uh, product proliferation can sometimes be effective to basically overcrowd the product space with, with many, many products. And, and the broader benefit for the family or for the incumbent firms is that this makes market entry difficult, especially for small and new firms. So that is basically the key, the key intuition uh, of the argument. And, and it's, it's worthwhile emphasizing in what sort of market environments the argument likely works better or worse. So a key, a key element of a market in which such a strategy can be effective is in markets that have uh, what we call a low dimensional product space is a market where there are a few product, uh, product dimensions along which incumbent firms or firms can differentiate their different offerings. Another way of saying is that this is a market in which it is difficult to meaningfully innovate product offerings. So if you want to think about breakfast cereals, uh, it's things like, you know, how much, how sugary versus salty the cereal? Is it going to be crispy or not so crispy, uh, whole grain or not? and maybe with or without chocolate chip cookies or something like that. So it's a, it's a very small number. And once you have these dimensions um, and, and there's not much more you can do in the absence of meaningful innovation, that strategy can be effective because in, in that particular case, incumbent firms can simply try to launch one product for each possible combination of these few dimensions and, and occupy uh, the entire space and, and that makes it very hard to bring in any sort of new product into the market as a new firm and, 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 and thereby um, can help to deter market entry. And the argument of our paper is that we think that this argument 
Uh, and this logic applies to the mutual fund industry. And we wanna put this idea to an empirical test in this paper. So how does it exactly translate? I've been talking about serials. Let's move uh, to mutual funds. So what we're gonna argue is that fund and style proliferation has allowed families to divide what is essentially a very low dimensional product space into an ever finer grid. Because one, one question you might ask yourself is, well, how does this observation of style proliferation that we have hundred different styles now, how does it square with our conjecture that the product space actually has very low dimensionality? It would suggest that if you have so many new styles, the product space has expanded in terms of, in terms of uh, dimensionality. What we're gonna tell you is like, no, the, the style proliferation that we do observe is of a very different nature and it is not necessarily reflective of a, of a major uh, expansion in the mutual fund product space in terms of product characteristics that are being offered. And if this is the case, then families can take advantage of this by simply dividing a low dimensional space into an ever finer grid of subspaces and then occupy that space with a large number of funds, which leads to the outcome that market entry is difficult for small firms, especially, and it leads to markets that are increasingly dominated by few families that are large and that have essentially identical fund offerings, each of which occupies the entire mutual fund product space. So if I wanna put that in a picture, if we start, let's say, uh, when Morningstar started with the famous three by three grid, um, you know, at that point, maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a motive to have nine different funds, one in each square, now, how do we get to a situation where we're all of a sudden close to a hundred different? It could be because we're adding a lot of, a lot of uh, dimensions. What we're gonna argue is as a first order, what has happened is this, is that the existing space has simply been partitioned into an ever more granular subspace that would allow families to simply place one fund, not in one of nine, but one of 99 uh, different uh, quadrants and thereby create this notion that the IO literature uh, calls congestion. And, um, and, and, the, and the broader industry implication is that that makes it hard for, especially for small firms, not for large firms, but especially for small firms to enter, gain market share to cover the fixed cost of entry. Hey, that is David. in a nutshell the, the, the argument. So is there a question? Yeah, hey, David, uh, I myself have a question. So. This argument on congesting the space, yeah. um, one element of it is that they share the common space. In the zero, like, you know, they're competing for the shelf like space on a supermarket. My point is related to entry cost. Okay, it's like they are competing for the same space. In order to congest space, they have to be in the same space. They try to enter. So what do you think of like what are the entry costs for, you know, for in the setting of mutual and families? Now, are they competing for the same space per se, like in the, in the, in the, zero, in the zero market? So, so, so the space that we're talking about is the one for active equity funds. So, so, so th this is a paper about the active equity fund product space. So what we're basically saying is a condition on, you wanna be in that space, which is right. offering an active equity mutual fund. This is like the situation that you're going to fight, uh, that you're going to face as a firm. Now I've, I've highlighted, we're highlighting here that the argument applies in particular to small firms where, and, and the idea of entry cost is simply that, you know, once you want to offer your first mutual fund uh, as a firm, um, and, and, and if this is all you do, then you need to have a certain minimum AUM level to have the revenues to sort of uh, support that a fixed cost of having setting up that first fund. And as families grow larger, you know, on the margin, that is probably gonna go down. So they, these large families can launch many, many more, but, but to enter, to be there in the first place, um, that is a strategy that is mostly aimed at deterring the small firms. So it's not uh, it's not an argument that I'm gonna and I'm gonna show you some evidence. I'm I'm not saying that this is not an industry that is that cannot be disrupted, but the disruption has to be from a larger scale sort of firms. 
right, it's right. hard to sort of disrupt my, it from a smaller yeah point my point is also related to see in the serial market in order to enter you have to break into their supermarket space the yeah. entry cost is quite high yeah but when how big what 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 like dollar amount we're talking about for a small firm to offer what are the like entry costs, what are their, you know, dollar amount, you know, do you have anything? I don't, I don't know what the entry cost is, but what I, what I sort of do know from casual conversations with people is sort of what is the AUM that you need sort of right. to break even as a right. firm? Like what, is, like what is the AUM? And, 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 and that number, the numbers I hear is like floating between 30 and 50 million of firm level AUM is sort of like, you know, it's the sort of the break even number for, for, an, for an asset management firm, given the fees that are market level fees, and, and given the, the cost, you know, the fixed cost and the uh, whatever the setup costs for these firms are like, I, I, I can only answer it in terms of like, what is the AUM? Right. So basically, right, right. Well, that, that, that number sounds reasonable. Yeah. Thank you. So, so this is the argument and, 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 and the rest of the paper we're trying to, uh, we'll be trying to uh, convince you on the key elements of this argument, showing you uh, empirical evidence um on that before i go there let me just uh summarize a little bit where we think the paper uh fits and contributes to the literature um there's the first literature that i've already highlighted on family strategies and fund proliferation there's a particular observation that uh, already the corona surveys paper has established that most funds are launched by uh, by large firms by large families they launch the highest number of funds but the JF paper, the recent one by Kostovetsky and Warner, uh, makes the point that that is true. However, it is the funds launched by small firms that, quote unquote, seem to be more innovative. And we, we're going to be careful with the word innovation here. But at least these are the funds that are in our, we would say, that do not conform or that seem to be more non-conforming and, and therefore differentiated and perhaps innovative. Uh, there. So basically, uh, the type of funds that are being brought to market by large versus small firms are very different. And, and, and what we're basically going to bring in is again, we want to basically uh, present an hypothesis that not only reconciles these motives to launch funds and different styles, but we also want to reconcile this with the overall evolution of the industry, with the evolution, not just in, in terms of firm size distribution, but also in terms of what is the the, the, the product offerings, how are they characterized uh, for different types of firms and what does it mean for the market level product offerings? So we want to really bring in a unified uh, hypothesis that brings all these things together in one framework. And in that way, we're also going to relate to the Nanda and Massa literature. Um, on the product space, um, maybe if you're sort of empirically as a pricing minded, um, the argument that the mutual fund product space has low dimensions is almost a one-to-one -one restatement of, of basically sharp 92 that says if you think about the product space in terms of in terms of styles then the whole point of why we have styles is because we want to reduce the dimensionality of having to choose rather than having to choose between 2000 stocks we want to choose between a very small number of investment styles because these styles are sufficient to spend the cross section so from that point of view um, and then two papers by in the mutual fund literature, Dermin, Neven, and Tisse, and Maimaski and Spiegel, they say, well, from a portfolio construction point of view, there should be few funds because families would offer a small number of maximally differentiated funds. And then investors can simply pick a combination of them to, to, to hold whatever their portfolio is. So in that sense, the fact that the mutual fund product space, uh, as we say, has a low dimensionality is very much a reflection of this literature. And then finally, we talk about competition in the mutual fund industry. Um, there, the literature has mostly focused, importantly, on fees and alpha, price and quality, so to speak. Uh, we're going to bring in um, the overall choice of what is the, the choice of products that families actually offer to investors. And we're not going to speak too much about fees and fees and, and alpha. David, I we see have... two questions in the chat, maybe. I have a... Yeah, so we have two questions. The first one is from Rikas Aguilar. Um, his question is, are active mutual funds just competing with each other or they're also competing with index funds and ETFs with the growth yeah. in passive investing? Now, how does your analysis yeah. Um, yeah. take that into account? Very good. I'm going to have a very explicit slide on that. It's what, it's what we currently work on. And that is the kind of disruption that I have referred to uh, when I was answering uh, your uh, question before. 
Um, if I if I may, I would like to hold this for the end because I have an explicit result on how the rise of ETF is potentially going to affect um, the dynamics that we document over the past uh, 70 years because the rise of ETFs is like the last 10 years. We're going to take a worldwide global analysis starting from the 30s until today, and we're gonna we're gonna bring in that disruption at the end of the talk. That that's that's a great thought. Sure. Um, the second question is from Sugata Ray. What is the role of sub advisors in, in your study? So the, the, we're going to take a perspective at the family level because what we what we want to uh, understand is the families who market and distribute the funds. Uh, how do they position the funds in the product space? Um, the sub advisors they're typically the ones who would manage the portfolio, right? They would they would carry out the portfolio management. Uh, in our sense, we're, we're more interested in how the, the ones in the front line, which are the families who distribute and market the funds, how do they decide on their product offering vis-a-vis -vis the customer who's buying it? So it, it, it's, really a, it's really a paper that is, that is around the family rather than the, the portfolio management company. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. So here's the outline of the talk. Um, there's three parts. The first one is uh, I'd like to convince you about this important element, which is the low dimensionality of this product space. And I want to do this by characterizing the mutual fund product space. I will speak about the data and how we do that. That's the first important element. Second, then, we'd like to move to the family um, strategies. And especially, we want to understand how fund proliferation at the family level um, how that leads to the evolution of family level offerings, to what extent families engage in this practice of trying to occupy the entire space, what I showed on this, on this granular style grid uh, two slides ago, whether this is actually what's happening or whether families uh, have different paths as they grow their offering. And from there, I wanna draw the first implications on the aggregate. What does this mean for aggregate fund offerings in terms of what are the type of funds and what is the composition of the fund menu um, at the aggregate market level, given the results that we will first document at the family level. And then in the third part, I wanna come back and, and, and tease out some additional predictions from the IO literature on how fund proliferation and entry deterrence um, can work together. And this is mostly going to be a section by trying to differentiate the behavior of incumbent versus new or small firms and how they how these two types of firms act differently uh, under these under this particular hypothesis and whether there's empirical evidence to support that. All right. So let me go let me go into data. So what are we doing here is uh, our main sample is the Morningstar universe of all active equity funds that have ever existed dead or alive. So Ultimately, this is a paper where we want to draw implications at the market and at the industry level. So we want to have the most comprehensive sample possible to make sure we have, you know, we can actually make credible statements along those lines. So we have very minimal data requirements here, and it'll become clear why. Um, the four requirements that we do have is that we need to have information on the fund legal name. So we want to know what the name of that fund is. And I'm going to explain very clearly on the next slide why because we want to need, we need to understand and measure the positioning of the fund. We need inception obsolete dates to understand when the fund uh, was sold and when it potentially disappeared from the market. We need the family affiliation uh, to talk about families. And also we want to know in which countries the fund was available for sale so that we can actually characterize fund offerings at the market level because many funds are sold in several markets or across borders. So if we want to if we want to understand the market level offerings, we want to make sure that we take full into account where the different funds are actually uh, available. So that ultimately leads us to a sample where we have more than thirty nine thousand funds dead or alive, which ultimately covers more than ninety percent of the Morningstar database because our data requirements are are so slim at that first stage. We're not we're not at this point not yet requiring data on fees and returns that comes later. Uh, ultimately, we're going to cover 77 different markets, and we're basically going to track the industry from the inception in the US in the 30s up until 2016 when, when we had downloaded that data. That is our main sample. I'm going to present most of the results today on this main sample, but I want to I point out one thing 
is that in the revised version, we will also uh, have a match sample because Morningstar is very comprehensive on all these dimensions, but there's one caveat potentially is that Morningstar only reports the latest name for each fund. So we do not have in Morningstar a time series on how families name their funds. And I, I, and, and I told you that the name is important. So in order to, to potentially understand if that is an issue, we create a matched sample where we match the US fund to CRISPs and the, Europe, the European and some Asian funds to a new database, which is Eurofidi, which is a um, French data provider that is basically trying to be the European CRISP as far as I understand, and we collect dynamic names from those. So we can get a, a matched sample of just about 20,000 funds, a bit more, which brings our sample down to 52 markets where we cover at least 50% of the offerings. And the sample period shortens basically to the crisp period, 61 until today. And, um, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not gonna speak a bit uh, more about it, but for today's talk, most of the results will be on the main sample, which is the most comprehensive one. And, 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 and in general, our results are very robust and if anything understated in that main sample. So this is what this sample looks like. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it here at the country at the market level, ordered by the oldest country, which is the US in, our, in, in the world, I guess, not in our sample. Um, and we call it year zero is the year 1931, which for the purpose of our paper, we say is the year when there were 10 funds available then we start including because we're going to talk about dispersion in offerings. So we want to have at least a minimum number of 10 funds. It's not very sensitive, but that's what we do. And, and here you see how the number of funds available for sale in the US has grown to about seven and a half thousand in, uh, in 2016. The total sample is close to 40,000 different funds. And, 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 and the first thing I want to sort of highlight here is that a statistic that I have highlighted before, which is the growth rate, either in the number of funds or the number of firms, families in these different markets. And you see across these 20 top markets, the list goes to 77 in the paper. You see that the number of funds tends to grow much faster and much stronger compared to the number of firms in these different markets. And this is true across the board. There's hardly any exception in the data for a market where this is not true. So it seems to be a very general observation that fund growth tends to be much stronger than firm growth, which is an observation that uh, at least Massa 2003 ha already has it in the US. And it's a very pervasive phenomenon as you go around the world. Now, here's the first empirical um, exercise that we wanna do. We wanna measure the positioning of funds in the product space. So the question is, how do we do this? In a way, that extracts the most important information and is comprehensive for the entire industry. So here's what we do. We're gonna analyze the fund names in a very simple way, but arguing that this is in fact, probably the, the most accurate and comprehensive way to measure how families position a fund in the product space. And I wanna highlight that we care about the positioning of a fund. We are not that much interested whether that positioning corresponds to what the fund actually does, but we wanna know how the family places and presents the fund to investors in the product space. And this is precisely what the name serves to do. You know, names, we know that names from past literature are deliberately chosen by families to articulate to investors what the most important product features are, right? There's a, there's a paper in the JF, Cooper, uh, Dulin and, and, and Rao, showing how families strategically sometimes switch names to appeal to different trends, et cetera. There is name rules in, in different uh, jurisdictions that tell you that if this is what the fund does, then this is how you can name or not name it. And, and this is essentially what we want to harvest. This is the information we want to harvest. And we want to harvest this from families because we want to know how families make these decisions. We do not want to harvest how Morningstar proliferates that whole thing. A nice byproduct of this exercise is that this is information that is available for virtually everyone. So we can retain our full sample coverage um, and uh, without uh, any significant loss of information for the purpose of what we're trying to do here, right? There's no argument that more detail is available if you look into the prospectus, but that's a second layer that is not even necessarily uh, all that important for our analysis because the positioning is what we seek to measure. So on the right-hand side of this slide, I have a few uh, examples and uh, many of them will, will be familiar to you. What I want to highlight at this point this also includes all the different languages, right? We have a worldwide analysis. We have all the different languages, uh, French, German, whatever you have. 
this is just the legal name of the fund and that's the starting point of what we do. So how do we extract uh, what families uh, evidently want to uh, articulate as the positioning of the fund? We do something very simple. We collect the name for each fund. We remove the firm and the brand name from the fund as well as a very small list of very generic words like the word fund or the word equity. And, and what we do then is we stack all the remaining words into a vector sorted by frequency and we simply get the list of most popular words that family have decided to put in the name of the fund, including different languages and everything. I see a, I, I see a question has just popped up from Vikas. What is investors' ability to discern between granular classification? Is there a threat cannibalization from existing styles that are closely related to newly launched styles? Um, so this is about this is about the the sequencing and 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 the positioning of how families place the different funds that they have as they grow. That's the way I understand the question. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to that in two slides. If you can hold that if you can hold that thought on what it means for cannibalization and positioning. As, as funds grow uh, in the space of the family. Let, let me hold that question for a second. I think it's a very, it's a very interesting one. Sure. At this point, let me just tell you that this is a very, very simple exercise that is meant to extract the most salient features that families seek to put into the names. And there's, there's many reasons to think that this might turn up nothing because families, you know, they use all sorts of, uh, all sorts of words in the fund names. Um, to do to communicate whatever they want to communicate, but this is what we do, and 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 the result of which is very striking, uh, in the following way. So let me show you um, the cumulative frequency of the most popular words that families choose to put into fund names, as a function of how many funds in the universe we actually cover. So this dot here is the most frequent word in the list. It appears in about 10% of all fund names, global ever. It's the word global. So the word global appears in about 10% of all names, followed by the word growth and the word value. So we have three words that cumulatively already appear in over 20% of all funds. It's a, very, it's a very small number. If you go to the top 10, you have 40% of the universe covered in the sense that at least the fund name contains at least one of those 10 words in the name. After that, and you can see that um, from the scale of this graph here, the information content starts dropping pretty rapidly, pretty quickly. If you, if you extend the list from 10 to 20, you cover about half the universe. After that, it gets very idiosyncratic. So if you wanna, if you wanna cover 20% more, of funds, you need to expand the list from 20 to 100. So the information content of every incremental word starts dropping, dropping very rapidly. So this is the first indication that judging by the words that families select, there seem to be a very, very short list of words that families simply recycle and iterate as they, as they launch their funds. They, they basically pick attributes from a very, very short list of words which already points to what the low dimensionality I wanna get at. And we haven't even translated anything, right? This is foreign language. We haven't grouped anything. This is literally uh, the raw words that, that remain once you remove the brand names and three or four words like portfolio or fund. Because it turns out you can actually reduce that exercise even more. So this is the list of the top 20 words, right? This is the word global. I was mentioning it, 10.4% frequency. And, 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 and you go down that list. This is the top 20 that we just observed from the data. And as you look at this, what you realize is that, well, 11 out of those 20 are actually geographical references. So we have the word global, international, Japan, Europe, et cetera. So once you see this, you cannot help but notice that obviously a geographic references is considered to be very important in what families put in the name. So we, we call this a, a, a first category. The category is called geography. Then we go down the word growth, number two. We go down the list. You find the French word for growth, croissance. You find the German word for growth. You find the Italian word for growth, etc. Say, so, okay, the word growth seems to also appear 
in many languages around the world. So let's, let's make it a category. It covers many different funds. The word growth by itself already covers 8% of the universe. So, so let's do that. So we go down the list and we group basically the foreign language equivalents of all these words, uh, income and dividend, for example, and uh, the Spanish dividendos and whatever you have into categories. And we stop when the next category covers less than 1%. At that point you say, look, this is, does not seem to be something that on a global aggregate scale is really, is really uh, all that meaningful. So we're down to 10 then ultimately. And these are 10 categories um, and, and you see them here, including the top three words within that category. So you have the word growth here, which is itself 90% is already the word growth. And then you, you get a few foreign equivalents. Same for value, very familiar. There's no surprise here, right? This is just different versions of the word value. And, and, it, and it basically brings us down to what looks like very familiar now. Um, and that is after whatever, 60, 70 years of fund and style proliferation, we're still down to fundamental categories that, that are very familiar with and that haven't really, that haven't really moved much even though we have, we have seen 9% fund growth for many, many years. What's interesting is that pretty much all of this sounds very familiar. Here's one exception to our rule. There's one category that maybe we were a bit surprised that made the cut, it just made the cut, which is a sustainable category. So here's one counterexample to our argument. The one that we could find is, if you wanna think about it in terms of innovation, here is one that has made it to the aggregate. Is this very correlated with the actual self-declared funds time? Thanks, Juan Pedro. Let me let me answer this right on the next slide. So this is this is what we what we find. If you wanna if you wanna think about it in terms of dimension, you could say well, ten is even an overstatement because value and growth is really just one dimension that has two extremes, right? So that's fine. We can even make it smaller. The, the main point we're trying to say is that the dimensionalities are very small. These are the market shares. In these different in these different categories, and 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 uh, at just computed at the end of the sample at the country level, like what is the fraction of funds that appeal that appeal to the small category to the large category, etc. So Juan Pedro's question was exactly the right trigger. Well, this looks like very awfully familiar to the self-declared fund styles or to the or to the Morningstar classification, and. And, and the answer is, it is actually, it turns out to be very consistent. You can map this immediately to the Morningstar categories. However, if you look at the Morningstar categories, there's 100 of them. So what are these 100 categories? Well, the 100 categories is simply every possible cross product between these different ones. And that gets you from nine to 100, rather than having something fundamentally new. It's just about the, the main point that we're trying to make is that the many, many categories or the styles that do exist is not a manifestation of there being a lot of new things or innovation happening. It's simply the effort of cutting the existing space into very small granular subspaces. So if you look at this for Morningstar, you would simply say, oh, well, the dimensions have grown tremendously. Well, not really. They haven't really grown tremendously. The only exception of something that has, that has been you know, noticeably in the aggregate is that there's one more category, sustainable, that has come up. And, and that's, that's essentially it. Um, is, that, is that sort of answering the question, Juan? So yes, it is. It matches pretty well. It matches pretty well, yes. But the point is we don't want to use the Morningstar because the Morningstar is entirely proliferated. All right, so this is what it looks like. This is what the global menu looks like in 2016. Now, which we think is already pretty strong evidence that despite decades of fund and style proliferation, ultimately the product space in itself hasn't changed much. It, had, it has had low dimensionality 60 years ago and it still has it even though we have seen so many new funds and even though we have seen so many quote unquote new styles. David. Yes. So I, have, I myself have a question. So what is, what is the benchmark? Are we like supposed to see a huge increase in terms of the style uh, proliferation? So in, in a way to me, 
and like those styles seems to be a way of like investment investment philosophy. I mean, we haven't been seeing a whole lot of new like styles of exactly you know, beyond, right? So to to that extent is is somewhat expected. I mean, and the reason why system sustainable funds made to the cut is you know there are you know a certain group of investors believe yep. this is a new way of, of selecting stocks. Yes. And maybe and maybe in 10 years, if we repeat the exercise, it will no longer be there. Maybe. Maybe it will be very big. I don't know. Maybe it's the one thing that has changed. But ultimately, you're right. To the extent the, the benchmark is, I think the benchmark is, I think we're speaking about the same thing. The benchmark is that if Sharp 92 has told us there should be seven or six different styles, because that's what you need to spend the cross-section, then ultimately these dimensions haven't changed because you know, the cross-section of stocks can still be spanned by those same six, seven factors. So one thing I think you could um, do or you could show is what you show in the grid, in the cutting, you know, the, the combination of style in terms yeah. of the offering rather than independent. I mean, can yeah. I, can I, yeah, that's, that's exactly where I'm going now. That's exactly where I'm going now. That's exactly where I'm going now. So let me pick up uh, on, uh, on, on that question and, 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 and have your first piece of evidence, how we bring in um, the historical information. Because I want to, I emphasized uh, at the beginning that we are looking at the latest name for each fund, which immediately raises the question: Well, we, we we know that families change names. Is that important? So we draw on our matched sample with dynamic names to answer that. We can go back in time, and we want to particularly look at two questions. The first one is: Well, do we miss a category, something that has disappeared over time, and we're not doing justice to how the history of this product space has looked like? And the short answer is no. Um, the categories we show they have existed for decades and we cannot find any evidence of an omitted one that fell out of fashion. The second one is, is the question that you had just, just asked is, well, how are the dynamic name changes? And it also goes to the line of what Vikas was arcing, uh, are, are asking uh, a few minutes back. How are the dynamic name changes affecting our results? What are families doing when they launch more funds and they reposition? Do they cannibalize each other? Do they refine? the positioning of funds in the space, what, what happens on, on this important dynamic front. So that's where I think there's, there's a lot of interesting um, dynamics uh, coming into and we draw this into the new version of the paper. So here are the dynamics and fund names. Let me show you first this. This is a, this is a chart where uh, it's going back in time. So this is time zero is either the end of the sample or the last year when a fund existed. And then we go back in time minus 10, minus 20, 30, 40 years. And this black line tracks the fraction of the population that has had a material name change as you go back minus 10, 20, 30 years. Material, we mean a name change that would replace or refine or reposition the fund in the space. There are many more name changes, but most of them are completely idiosyncratic, changing the branding, small textual changes, nothing that is material in the sense that it would change the positioning of the fund. So the first thing that you see is as you go back about 30, 40 years, only about 25% of funds actually have such a change. So about 75%, um, for 75%, three quarters of the universe, um, that actually doesn't even happen. So, but for the other one, the most important source of name changes is that over time, the families are adding categories to the name. So this is, we call them category additions. These are basically the situations where a global equity fund is renamed into the global value, uh, global value equity fund. It's just adding a second reference to the name. And over time, we see actually more of those references in fund names. So the number of references to categories increases as we go, uh, as we proceed in time, which is basically um, very much consistent. So most of them, actually, most of the name changes, if anything, serve to refine the positioning, which is, I think, what Vikas has asked, is basically trying to position the fund into the smaller part so it doesn't necessarily overlap with other, with other offerings of the family and thereby fill up the grid. The remaining ones are either removals or switches, right? A switch is if a fund is renamed from value to growth. There's about you know, less than 5% typically of, 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 of all the things that happen is when that happens. And removals is also the smaller part. So from that fact alone, um, um, we basically we basically see that you know the name changes, if anything, probably magnify our results because 
there's two things. There's the composition of what the family offers and then second, how they reposition what they already have. And the repositioning for the most part seems to be in line is that, well, they reposition to refine existing funds on a final grid. They, I have no they, evidence on managers. Right, so um, Juan Pedro uh, Gomez has a question. Any evidence on uh, managers changing when the name changes? We have not uh, at all uh, looked into it because uh, as, as a first part, we're not really like not really interested in what they do. And if they also change what they do, it's really about how they position themselves, right? If they keep doing what they're doing, maybe if they change, maybe, but ultimately what matters is we want to know like how the family is basically trying to carve out the product space. Yeah. Yeah, so we haven't looked into it. One thing I thought uh, related to Vika's question about uh, cannibalization, one thing I, I, I think it will be interesting if you show something within the family, when the family refine a global yeah. fund into global value, yeah, you know, does it affect the other names or global growth they had or, or something? So, so I think this stats yeah. is probably in the aggregate. If you do that within a family, that, that yeah. will speak to some of the cannibalization uh, which yeah. I was asking. And that is that is basically one of the things that's going to come in um, 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 as we look at the family strategy. Let me go. Let me go right there, and I'll, I'll tell you what we have. And, uh, and we can do a, certainly a bit more. So here's the thing. So now let's move into actually look into these family strategies. Um, how does fund proliferation uh, interact with the family's you know, strategy to potentially occupy the entire space uh, in the product market? So here's the question. Do families actually seek to occupy the entire space as they proliferate and grow, right? Or do families become specialists, right? If they have many funds, do they launch them in very small categories to become a specialist? Or do they seek to span everything? What is the what is the major driver of that? So to measure that, we basically create a family level measure of how different the family offering is from the aggregate global offering. Uh, is the family moving closer to the overall market, uh, or or is it is it becoming specialized, for example, right? And 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 here we basically it's a very simple distance measure. This is the sum over all the categories. What's the what's the share? Of the category J in the family's menu relative to the global uh, market share of this category in terms of number of funds. And, and as a starting point, we use that global market share at the end of the sample, the end of sample market share, simply because this is the most proliferated menu that we observe. And we want to understand, do families basically converge into it or do they sort of move away and become um, specialized and very, very dispersed? That's, our, that's, that's what we do. David, we, and then, have, we have two questions before we move on. Um, the first one is from uh, Clemens Scheim. Are name changes driven by poor performance or uh, low flows? Do families shift toward names that experienced high flows recently? So the, so the second part of this question, that the answer is the Cooper, uh, Gulen and Raw paper in the JF, that there's some elements that families sort of strategically switch depending on where the flows go. Um, this is, I showed you that this is about only 5% of all the switches that actually, that actually happen. So you have some of this behavior going on. What we're sort of saying is that in the aggregate, that is, first of all, most of it is assumed by time fixed effects in the end. If there are period sort of effects, why some families launch more growth versus value in one year versus another, we absorb for that. The general big trend that we see is that um, as the family proliferates, it basically successively just occupies the entire space. And um, but other than that, we have not fully investigated the name changes more, but we can do that. Okay. The second question is from Tong Yao. Um, some of the fund name changes may be response to regulatory requirement that fund name should, should reflect investment style. Um, I, I guess uh, maybe his question is about, you know, um, uh, Tong, uh, if, if uh, my uh, understanding is incorrect, I think may maybe so maybe the, the underlying style change first and then the name change like after that. Um, what the implication for your analysis? Um, in, in that, yeah, I guess that from top of my head, what I can tell you is that um, maybe, the, maybe, maybe, but what I show you is that what we show you is a pattern that is remarkably robust and consistent across 77 markets uh, over 80 years of history. So um, we're happy to, if you have particular regulatory changes in mind, I'm happy, very happy to look into it. Maybe it actually accelerates or not what we do. But other than that, I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer other than that. 
you know, in the, in the U.S., I mean, if you are a small, you know, cap fund, you know, yeah. the, the regulation says you have to invest in like eighty percent of exactly. the assets. Exactly. Exactly. Which which we think is basically uh, supporting our conjecture to actually look at the fund names because, in in many ways, you there's the name rule, right? The rule thirty five B or something, uh, that says basically what you write on the fund is the fund has to do that. And there's certain things you cannot write in the name. You, for example, you cannot allude to that the fund is sort of bailed out by the government or something like this. So there's mm -hmm. there's name rules, right? They basically right. say that the name has to be informative in, on some level. We have one, uh, uh, one more question from Vikas. Is it irrational on the part of investors to put money into newly launched styles because larger families may be able to attract better better managers? And an analogy um, is to uh, it, yeah. is that a company that makes good plain con uh, conflicts yeah. may be able to yeah. uh, uh, make better uh, chocolate conflicts. Yeah, and 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 I think there's good reason from the literature that you know high performing families they simply launch more funds because they get more flows, etc. And that is that is very much that is very much true. The I have two. My answer is two tiers. The first of all is that. Um, yes, but it doesn't necessarily speak about the composition of funds that they would offer. Why would then they offer uh, across the board everything? The other answer is empirically is that uh, we, we control for this because we know that the high pass performance gets you more flows and you can launch more, as well as other family characteristics. And, and it turns out to be for the composition of the menu um, that has very, very little explanatory power. Okay. So once we have this uh, distance measure, we run very simple panel regressions. Um, the key variable on the right-hand side is the log number of funds, which is a direct measure of the size and, uh, and, and the proliferation of the family's menu. We also have alternative tests where we just use the age of the family as a more like simply what is the maturity of that family. And the main controls are market level control, the level of competition in the market, past market return and size, we have firm level, of firm level controls, picking up on Vika's point, that are known to be related to fund launches, especially fees, fee dispersion, performance. And then we also have fixed effect. And in particular, I want to emphasize that we have firm fixed or family fixed effects that control for the type of the family or also allow us to really focus on the time series for each family. And then what we do is we run a very simple uh, panel regression as a first, as a first step where if, I, if you look into column one, we see that uh, the number of funds that the family offers is very negatively related to how far the family's menu is away from the aggregate. So the more funds, the more similar the family is to the aggregate offerings uh, in a global scale. What does point three mean here? Uh, negative point three, we are all reporting standardized coefficients here. So it makes the, the coefficient size is very comparable across all the controls. And 0.3 simply means for one standard deviation increase, you have a 30% standard deviation decrease on the dependent variable. So that's a 30% pass through, which we think of as a very, very strong economic uh, effect, especially if you compare this to some of the controls variable and like even import share, like how, how much the market is penetrated by foreign markets um, is, is, is only half that size. In column two, we move to a more stringent specification, replacing the country with firm or family fixed effects. Basically, we want to basically control for unobservable family types. You know, are there different types that just do things differently? What are and these types could be correlated with what the family wants to offer. You know, and if it if, if we basically if that is important, then it should probably you know eat into our effect. Instead, we see that the coefficient almost you know it goes up by two thirds. And it goes up to uh, minus 0.5. So as we go along, you know, for each family, the path is the larger the family gets, the closer the, the family offerings is to, 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 to the overall average, which basically implies that families just become more and more and more similar as they get bigger, which is sort of the overall notion that ultimately we're, we're basically we're evolving into a situation where there's large families that are basically identical in what they offer. And this is very robust to having additional time effects. And then when we control the different control variables at the family level, we have a sample shrinkage. Right? But that effect is, is very robust and it doesn't move uh, much. So it basically suggests that there is a situation where markets become dominated by large families that all look pretty much the same in terms of what they offer. 
they all occupy everything and, and, and are large and identical in terms of their offering. And this has immediate implications on, on, on what the market therefore should look like. It, if this is the case across many markets, then ultimately at the market level, the markets of mutual funds should ultimately be very, very homogenous in the sense that the composition of funds that are offered is basically the same everywhere. As the market grows or matures, and these families sort of start evolving and emerging, um, they become increasingly dominated by these few large families that are all identical, and therefore the overall market is likely to be very similar in terms of in terms of the composition of the overall offering. And this is exactly what what we then see. We basically repeat the exercise at the aggregate level, and we what we find is if you look at a at a mutual fund market at age zero, so when the country is born, so to speak, versus fifty years later. What you basically see is that the category, the dispersion in category shares gets compressed very tremendously. Like, you know, the, the, the dispersion of these different bars gets much, much tighter as the market grows. So it's not that, you know, the, the market proliferates into ever more differentiated different uh, funds. It's that at the aggregate level, they all convert to each other and become, become very, very similar. This, I, I would like to emphasize that this is an age rather than a time effect. This is not the case that in the year 95, everybody is offering more value funds along the lines of what Clemens was asking. Now, it's not about a particular year. It's about when an industry is age 20, 20 years old, then this is typically what the menu looks like in terms of dispersion. And as the industry grows, um, it, it, they all converge to the same composition in the end. So if, if, you, if you think about, well, the US, you know, the industry was born in the 30s and, you know, in the 70s or 80s, countries enter the sample, they do not immediately copy what the US menu looks like in the 60s and 70s. They go back to square one and then they run through the same cycle as the US did. So there's not much of a transfer in this sense going on. It's really like an age, an age effect almost that, 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 that characterizes the evolution of these aggregate offerings. Because you don't nearly get the same picture if you do these simple variance ratio tests by calendar time rather than by industry age. And, and, and the final answer on the, on the aggregate level is that if you repeat the same panel regression at the country level rather than at the firm level, you get the essentially the same results. Is that the older the industry is in a particular market, and this is the aggregate level here, right? The older it is, the more similar um, the market in that country will look like compared to, to, to where we are today at the global average. Uh, the, the same is true when you do it in number of funds. So here's one, here's one thing, because we had questions about the dynamics in the fund names. Column six and seven is a contrast between using the full Morningstar sample where we only have the latest name for each fund. So this is a result that is purely driven by composition effects and it is missing the part that I was highlighting that families refine the positioning of their funds as we go through time, that they put more references into the fund name as they grow, which basically means that the Morningstar overall sample underestimates what is actually happening because we are omitting the name changes that serve to reposition most of the funds in the product space. So if you basically repeat that last regression, only changing the static names to the dynamic names for the smaller sample, we actually find that the result gets actually stronger because, because column six omits these name changes that are actually helping us, uh, that are actually supportive of our, of our, of our argument. And, 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 and we're still working on, on working out uh, some of the suggestions that, 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 that were also brought up here. David, All right, I think I have about five minutes left. Is that right? Uh, David, I want to remind you, you actually have 10 minutes left. That's great, actually. So buy great. one, get one free. Are you asking for five? I'm giving you 10, so. That's great because I have three more tests, so that's good. And I, and I want to answer to Vikas on the ETFs that I don't want to, that I don't want to skip in the end. Good. All right, so we're now number three. So first of all, I hope I convinced you that the product space has low dimensions and it's been the same for many, many years. And the second one is that families have a strategy to occupy the entire space thereby creating markets that are dominated by large families with largely identical offerings, and therefore markets that are the first order of approximation are surprisingly homogenous 
in terms of what the aggregate offerings look like. Now let me move to point number three, where we want to work out a few more uh, a few more predictions on on the entry deterrence part, because I haven't really spoken about whether this strategy is potentially um, effective in deterring entry of new firms. Because the whole point of this exercise, according to a hypothesis, is that the families want to occupy everything so that there's very little space in the product market for a new firm to place a fund somewhere in the grid in the hope of getting market share, especially when you're a small firm and a new firm without reputation, for example. So what we're going to do in this one, we're going to, we're going to carve out some additional predictions on the behavior of incumbent versus new firms. So what are these predictions? In the IO literature, the literature has pretty much has worked out in great detail when um, this strategy of product proliferation works as an entry deterrent and what the behavior of these firms are. What are the, what are the key things? The, the first thing that you can learn here is that the convergence of the, of the menu, they should be driven by incumbent firms because it's the incumbent firms, the existing firms that, that want to occupy the space. So the way that these aggregate parents evolve, they should be driven by incumbent firms. They should not be driven by the launches of new firms. Because number two, the behavior of new firms in such a market needs to be very different compared to the behavior of incumbent firms. In the presence of incumbent firms that engage in product proliferation to deter entry, new firms, they need to quote unquote innovate. They need to be different. In such a market, you cannot basically enter the active equity mutual fund with, with, a, with a US large cap market as your first product, simply because that space in the product space is completely occupied by the incumbent firms. If you want to have any hope of getting a foothold in the market, the fund needs to look different, especially the early or the, the, the first funds that, that a family offers in that space, if it is a small family in particular. So new entrants need to innovate. They need to differentiate. They need to be different. However, once they have a foothold, the prediction is that, well, then they're going to change track and they're going to basically become an incumbent firm and from then on start to fill up the grid as all the other incumbents have done. But that is only conditional on survival. And number three is in the aggregate, if this is happening, then we should be seeing a firm proliferation that is more skewed towards large firms, the more proliferated the market is. So the more funds there are, the larger the skew towards large firms and away from small firms in the, in, in, in the market. These are sort of the three predictions that, that we now seek to test to see if, if entry deterrence is potentially you know, sort of quote unquote benefit to these incumbent families that engage in these kind of strategies. Let me pick up the first one. Is menu convergence driven by incumbent or by new firms? So this is a simple variation of the test that I showed you at the country or at the market level. We're simply looking, is the change in the aggregate distance, the aggregate dispersion uh, of a particular market relative to the global benchmark, who is driving it? What we find is that this is driven by, first of all, the new funds that are launched. They are driving the change, which is to be expected, I guess. But importantly, it is the new funds launched by incumbent firms that drive down this converge or that drive this convergence pattern in aggregate offerings. The new funds that are launched by new firms, they have no effect on how the aggregate composition evolves in any way. So it's the, it's the convergence in offerings that are driven by Again, the same behavior of incumbent firms that just simply seek to occupy everything in the space. Which then brings me immediately, well, then what are the new firms doing? What are the fund launches by new firms and how are they different compared to the fund launches by incumbent firms? So here's how we're going to pick up whether or not um, new firms launch a different type of funds. And, and the way we want to capture this sort of either innovation or how they differentiate is we're simply counting the funds that do not confirm to any of the categories that we have measured. We call them the no flag funds because they're not flagged. These are basically the Magellans of the world, the funds that have completely idiosyncratic names that don't tell you anything about what the fund actually does. Um, so as an investor, you see, if you're coming from Mars, you see the Magellan fund. If you know nothing else, that is basically not telling you anything. So you would have to read into the description, potentially see, okay, this is an interesting product. 
to and, and then potentially you, the family has your attention. So, but basically, these are the these are the funds that have idiosyncratic names. They do not conform to the grid. And what we find is that the fraction of these funds uh, is particularly high for firms that have very few funds. So, what these numbers tell you that if you have a, a small firm that has five funds. On average, it'll have 1.5 of those five are funds that do not confirm to the categories. These are funds with completely idiosyncratic uh, exposition in the product space. However, if the firm grows from five to 10 funds, and it now has 10 funds, you see that the fraction is 15%, which means out of the 10 funds, there are still 1.5 that are not conforming to the categories, which means that the next five, they were all conforming. So funds number six to 10, were all funds that were placed on the grid somewhere in this space. This is exactly what the literature would predict. You, the literature would predict that in the beginning, you need to look different. Whether you do something differently is a separate question, but you need to look different because otherwise you cannot enter that market. And conditional on survival, if it works, well, after that, they switch heads and they start launching new funds behaving the exact same way as the incumbents do which is very much consistent with the, the, the evidence in Kostovetsky and Warner that also show that, you know, it appears the new funds from small firms, they are more innovative. We would say they just do not conform. They, they do not conform to the product space. And, and the reason is simply because otherwise it wouldn't work in the presence of these incumbent firms. But at the same time, then these firms will get bigger. And consistently, we also see that then they change um, the funds that they launch. So these are not innovative firms per se. You now, in the extreme, the hypothesis says you need to innovate once. You need to innovate on your fund number one to get a foothold. And after that, in the extreme, you change your head and there's no longer any need for innovation, which potentially also explains why there are so few new categories coming up because ultimately there's very little to invent on here. And, and, and the third piece of evidence, uh, and that's the final one before I answer Vika's question is, what, do, what, do, what does the population of firms look like? And this is simply a, a very simple uh, figure from the data. It simply plots the percentage of new firms in the market as a function of how proliferated the market is. In other words, how many funds are sold in the market. And you can see very clearly that that drops very rapidly. The more proliferated the market is, the more funds there are, the smaller the population of small firms relative to the market. Because again, as the hypothesis will predict, these are markets that are dominated by, by large firms that, that have engaged in this particular form of menu proliferation. All right, these are, these are, these are, the, uh, um, these are the main pieces of evidence um, that I was planning to show today. Here's the last one. Oh, this is the same thing in a regression framework. I think we've seen that enough. Is something going to change this? We was asking, well, how does the rise of ETF actually fit into that overall hypothesis? Uh, that's a very interesting because the ETF, the rise of ETF in many ways is a disruption to the active equity mutual fund market, right? But the, the scale of the disruption is different. These are not small entrants into that market. The ETF uh, rise is, is characterized by another presence of very big firms. So these, these are the players that can potentially disrupt these sort of dynamics. And what we see, in fact, is that it already has a noticeable impact on family offerings. So we're including another control variable in our family level regressions, which is the ETF share in the market of the family. And what we see is the larger the ETF share, family menus actually become more dispersed. So all of a sudden, families seem to be changing that sort of behavior uh, if there is strong ETF competition in the market, suddenly offering more differentiated menus because now potentially there's the nature of the game in town has changed a little bit. It does not, however, affect uh, too much our, our overall estimate, but, uh, but in terms of you know, going forward, uh, potentially promises that this, this sort of disruption in the, in the active uh, mutual fund market uh, is potentially going to have uh, impact on, on, on family and aggregate level fund offerings. So I hope, uh, so this is all we have at this point on this one because uh, we, we are following this, a similar train of thought. So I hope uh, at this point that this is all I can answer you, uh, Vikas. 
Great. Uh, David, uh, do you want to conclude? Briefly? Yeah, I'm, We're right I'm on done. Time. No, and this is all I was planning on saying. Uh, here's the concluding remarks. Um, I've said it many times, so I'm not going to read the slide. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, very constructive. And um, I'm happy to stay on if there are for, further questions. Um, sounds great. Thank you so much for the, for the very intriguing paper and excellent presentation. I'll uh, stop the recording here.